I'm excited about the topic today, but if you have a question, please put them in the Q&A section. I know you'll still put them in the chat and that's totally okay. We'll, we'll be able to answer your question. We'll see you the video re replay and the slides for this entire presentation. If you need the caption, go ahead and look at the bottom of your Zoom screen and click on that CC button. I'm gonna move out of the way and turn this over to Ryan Harrington. He's here from Tech Impact. He's the director of Data Labs. Ryan, thank you so much for being here and have a great webinar. Awesome, thanks so much. Really, really excited to be here with everybody and love seeing some of your like very initial stories in the chat right now about whether you're using AI or how you're starting to think about using AI. And I'm excited to explore that a little bit more with you all. Um, so just, there we go, had to do some housekeeping. Um, Aretha, you can see my screen, I'm sharing correctly. Yeah. Awesome. I don't ever trust sharing screens, so really appreciate that for sure. So today I'm really excited to talk with you all about generative AI. How can you harness the power of generative AI for good? Um, and as Aretha mentioned, so my role is that at Tech Impact, I'm our director of our Data Innovation Lab. And so that's a unit that is really specifically focused in on how we can help nonprofit organizations or organizations more broadly in the social and public sector use data effectively to advance their missions, to make data-driven decisions, and do the work that they need to do more effectively on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if you're not familiar with Tech Impact, we're a nonprofit that's on a mission to use technology to better serve the world. And we do that in a whole bunch of different ways, everything from workforce development programs of our own to providing services for nonprofit organizations so that they can meet their missions just that much more effectively. Um, so just to get us started, um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing as you answer this, um, I'd love if you all could take a moment to just tell me a little bit about your experience. Um, so I've got a Slido up on the screen. I think we're going to put the link for that in the chat for everybody so that you can get it. Though so you can go to slido.com and enter in that number or use a QR code, whatever is easiest for you. It'd just be really helpful level setting for me to get a sense of where are you coming from? What does the audience look like overall? So four options for you here. Um, one, and these are actually out of order right now because someone's already answered the poll, um, but Perhaps you've never used generative AI tools before. So that could be something like ChatGPT or Copilot or Gemini. Maybe that you're just personally using a free or a paid version of a generative AI tool. Um, you know, whatever frequency that might be, daily, monthly, every once in a while, whatever it is. Um, you might have a paid version through your organization. And that's typically going to be something like Copilot or ChatGPT Enterprise. We'll talk about some of those options later. Um, or maybe your organization has built something, built some kind of custom tooling using generative AI to solve a problem more specific to you. Um, so just take a, a couple of minutes to answer that. I see 27 folks have done that so far. I'll, I'll let that tick up a little bit. And while we're doing that, I'll talk about what today is going to look like. Um, so my goal for today is to help give you an introduction, not just to some of the basics of generative AI, so some of those free and paid tools, we'll talk about that certainly, especially because I know some folks here really haven't had the chance to use those tools, but that's not the main goal. My main goal for today is actually to talk you through some of the problems that you might start to encounter when using some of those tools and some of the technologies and tools that are starting to emerge that are gonna help you overcome some of those problems because you might think about using those in your own organization on a day to date basis to do your work just a little bit more effectively, a little bit more efficiently. Um, awesome. And I'm seeing the polls coming in that it seems like a lot of folks on the call um, are personally using a free or paid version of it. So I'm going to make the assumption that people are familiar with the idea of prompting and how that works. You are probably using ChatGPT. They definitely own the market share, um, but you might be using a tool like Gemini, for example. Um, just to get us started, though, as we go through it, I want to talk a little bit about what is generative AI. So thank you to all of you who filled out the poll. It's going to close as I advance the slide. Um, so what is artificial intelligence? I think it's really worth stepping back and thinking about that first, because generative AI slots into artificial intelligence overall. I don't want to belabor this point, but I think it's really helpful to start from that baseline. Um, so there's a really great definition that I came upon. It's a machine-based system that can, for a given set of human-defined objectives, make predictions, recommendations, or decisions influencing real or virtual environments. And of all the places that that came from, that's actually a legal definition from a National Defense Authorization Act, um, but I think it actually covers things pretty well. 
AI is a very broad set of technologies, but the key thing to understand is that they take advantage of inputs being put into them, then predictions of some kind are made, and then from there, there's an output that we are able to take advantage of. And while I think when people talk about AI right now, colloquially, people mean generative AI, there's actually a whole bunch of other types of technologies that fall into the broad definition of AI that I think are just worth mentioning and worth talking about, some of which you've definitely encountered on a day-to-day -day basis. And I just want to call those out and make sure we're aware of those going forward. Um, so here's a good list of some of those. There's machine learning. That's a phrase you've probably seen before. It makes its way into robotics, into expert systems. There's an idea of computer vision, of planning, speech, and then natural language processing. And I'm just going to highlight a couple examples from each of those. So machine learning, really good example, one that you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if you are watching Netflix at all, maybe you're a Bridgerton kind of person. Um, this is actually a screenshot from one of the folks on my team's Netflix, because I actually don't have it. Um, and you're probably used to Netflix giving you this idea of, hey, because you watched Grey's Anatomy, here are all these other shows that would probably make sense for you to watch, like Bridgerton or like Gilmore Girls. And in the background, the technology being used there is an example of machine learning. It's a recommendation system that's taking data, not just from you, but from a whole bunch of other people. That's the input. It's making a prediction about what you'd like, and that becomes your output. Or another great example that you've seen before is like on Amazon. Um, I'm a big fan of Malcolm Gladwell's work. I love the book Outliers. It was my introduction to a phase of reading books with one word book titles for a while. Um, and because customers bought outliers a little bit further down the page, um, customers who bought that might also like to read these other books. You see like Blink or David and Goliath um, or What the Dog Saw, some other amazing works by Malcolm Gladwell, but certainly some other books besides that. Same idea. This is a machine learning example of we have a prediction we or we have an input of what you like. Um, then there's a prediction about what else you might like and an output telling you what to look like. Um, another example is this idea of computer vision. And if you have a Tesla, for example, um, this is what's trying to power a self-driving car, at least part of the process of what's going on there. And so you can see in these examples, this is what your car might actually be seeing, probably a simplified version of it. So in the top half, you're seeing the computer is trying to segment what you're seeing. So green are areas it can drive, blue is other cars, red is other people. Um, and then in the bottom half, you're seeing it try to capture specific things and track those specific people or cars or whatever else the objects are in it. And that general task is a computer vision task, another part of AI. Speech, I'm guessing most of the people in this room have some version of an assistant, whether it's in their home or on their phone, Siri, Alexa, or Google, um, Google Home of some kind. That's a speech example. But what we're really here today is to talk about natural language processing. And that's really what generative AI has become all about, in addition to some other types of tasks. How do we take the natural language that people are speaking and use that in order to turn it into tasks, into outputs that we can use and that speaking or writing or whatever way people are entering that information. And so AI is this broad set of things. And I just wanna remind us generative AI is this smaller subset, but certainly has really increased the popularity of AI on a day-to-day -day basis. So how does generative AI differentiate from that? And there's a couple really key ways. So it's kind of in this subset of natural language processing. AI models that given inputs can generate novel and relevant contents, such as images, text, audio, and other types of modalities beyond that. So it's this really, once again, this broad area. We're used to ChatGPT, but it actually could be other types of tools and techniques besides that and it could generate all different types of things. There are four key components that I would say differentiate a generative AI model from other types of AI models that you might see in the world. Those four things are, one, generative AI models are taking advantage of internet scale data. And so when I say internet scale data, I mean truly the whole internet. If we wanted to compare it, it's the difference between a lot of AI models are looking at Maybe if you compare it to a library, for example, they're using a book to build the model, whereas a generative AI model is using the Library of Congress. 
or multiple libraries of Congress in order to build the backbone of what the models look like. Another really key differentiator is that they're really focused in on content creation. It's all about making new and unique things. And there's actually maybe some controversy around the creation piece of it, but that's one of the major goals. A third piece is there's this high level of variability and creativity, and you can actually control how variable and how creative some of those models are with some more advanced techniques you might use. And the last piece is this idea of various modalities. So the outputs can actually end up being multiple types of things. And that's a really, really helpful and important piece. So we're gonna to concentrate today mostly on outputs being text and some of the things that you might end up doing with that ultimately. Generative AI can be used for a whole bunch of things. I'm guessing that folks here have used it for these types of tasks and other tasks. If I look at the left-hand column, I think of these as being some of the first types of tasks that people might use generative AI to help you with. Um, and then from there, you can expand what you're doing. And we'll end up be talking about some more of the right-hand side things today. I think of generative AI first as like a really amazing tool to help me write a first draft. It can be really daunting to stare at the blank piece of paper. And generative AI helps me get over that hump. But then I know that I need to go edit it down really significantly. Sometimes I've written something already, and instead I need a tool that can help be my editor and refine the language that I'm using. And so I might use it in that case as well. I might have a big like batch of text that I need to get through, and I need a partner that can help me summarize it. And Generative AI can be perfect for that case as well. I might wanna ideate ideas and just come up with new things and have a partner that can kind of push me and help me expand my thinking a little bit. Or I might get a use case where I want to extract or classify some data. So like give it a whole bunch of text and say, hey, go find all the dates and tell me what happened in it. And that can really, really augment my work and make it easier for me to get my work done. Some more advanced things, maybe you want to be able to automate some of your communication as an organization. You want to interact with the people who are working with you and make it easier. Those are classically chatbots, but there are things you might want to do to customize that for your own organization. Maybe you have content that you need to localize to different places. Maybe you're starting to think about code or just other general ways to augment your work. So let's talk through some of these problems you might encounter. We're going to start with almost a fake problem um, just to set the stage for things. And then we're going to talk through, as you're using these different technologies, the problems you might encounter and then solutions you might think about in order to solve some of those problems. So first, kind of our basic fake one. Um, Let's say that you want to begin using generative AI in our practice. I know there were a few folks here who said they haven't actually started doing that. Maybe you're aware of some of these things already. Maybe you're not. Wherever you're coming from, that's great. There are some great out-of-the-box tools that you don't really need to spend a lot of time setting up or thinking about. I think the one that I've mentioned already quite a few times here that is probably the entry point that a lot of people have to generative AI is ChatGPT. And if you haven't used it, very straightforward to use. If you just go to chat.openai.com, um, it it's very easy for you to go ahead and just start using it and prompting um, and getting that work done. And the basic way that you end up using it is you give the um, tool some instructions, ChatGPT or Gemini, some instructions and say, hey, I want you to make a schedule for um, for my day with these constraints in it. And it will go ahead and the output will be that schedule for you. And you might have to refine it a little bit. Um, Gemini is Google's product and it does the same thing. And there's actually a lot of other products like this that exist, but those are two that certainly dominate the market, particularly on the free off the shelf tool side of things. And so I would highly recommend that as a starting point for folks. Now, as you keep doing your work, you might find that you want to make your prompts better and better and better. Um, and you'll start to iterate and figure out some techniques to be able to do that. Now, there's this concept called prompt engineering. And so this is kind of a secondary solution that you can use not just for free tools, but this applies across the board for all of the topics I'm gonna talk about today. Now, prompt engineering is an entire other topic that we could end up going into. It could, it could be its own one hour webinar or workshop, or probably longer than that, honestly. But I wanna share a few tips that I've learned to try to make better prompts that I think might be immediately applicable for folks here, whether you've used ChatGPT or a generative AI tool before or not. 
Um, and some of these recommendations actually come directly from the team at OpenAI who builds ChatGPT. Um, so there's six that I think are really great that you could use in your practice right away. Um, and I'll give you an example in a second. Um, one, you might wanna think about including more details. Think about the AI actually almost more like a computer program. And even if you've never built a software program before, like I think at a high level, you might have the understanding of, we need to give computers really detailed instructions in order for them to be able to do the work that we want. Just because we're interacting with an AI, something like ChatGPT, doesn't mean that it doesn't still need all those instructions. So the more details you give it, the better. I think one of my favorite techniques is this idea of adopting a persona. And it's this weird trick, but if you simply just tell the machine, hey, I want you to act as if you are a nonprofit executive, or as if you are a person who is applying for uh, some kind of public benefit or whatever else it might be, it actually really helps the AI do a better job of giving you a better response. Sometimes you want to give it delimiters. So you want to give it specific things to fill out. Um, you might want to tell it the output length. For those of you who use ChatGPT regularly, you might know that it can be really wordy sometimes. It really likes to give you a long answer. And you might just need a paragraph. And so simply telling it that actually can really improve your output. You might give it steps to follow. And one thing that works really well is giving an example of an output that you would actually really prefer it to look like. So here's a quick example of what that looks like in practice. So here's a prompt that you might give a tool like ChatGPT. So for example, you might ask it to write a thank you letter to a grantee organization for attending a conference. I think if you were to give it that prompt, you would get a decent response, something that you could work with that you might be able to edit down. But if you actually just take advantage of a couple of these techniques that we mentioned, um, I'm gonna highlight two of them, including details and adopting a persona specifically, um, we can rewrite it and you'll end up with a significantly better response. So here's how a new prompt might look. You are a grant making officer at a large foundation. You want to build stronger relationships with grantees. Recently, grantees attended a conference focused on measurement and evaluation. Write a thank you letter to your grantees, including your excitement for them to begin using the techniques discussed at the conference. So you're asking it the same basic thing to write a thank you letter. But in the second example, after we've adopted a couple of these solutions, including some of the details and adopting a persona, you're just giving the tool a lot more to work with. That additional instruction is actually going to let it do a better job of helping you so that you have to do less work on the back end. Um, you definitely could have added in some of these other techniques. I avoided doing that just because I ran out of space on the slide, but you could imagine asking it to do that, you know, give me three paragraphs, or here's an example of a letter that I've written before, or something like that, and you would end up with an even better response overall. The more context, the better, but you just have to be thoughtful about what that context looks like. So you can use these types of techniques if you're not familiar pr with prompt engineering already. Like I said, this applies for every other technique that I'm gonna mention throughout the entire rest of the presentation. These are just best practices that you should be using regardless of where you're at in your generative AI journey overall. Now, the downside ultimately of using a free tool is that what you input is kind of public, not totally public. I don't want to scare you, um, but what you input there might end up getting used by the model that you're using. So if you're using ChatGPT and you enter in a whole bunch of information, you might end up with this case where they're going to use that in their training data. They're going to update the model and your responses are going to be included in that. So there's a little bit of a security issue, um, particularly if you're using sensitive data, you want to be really really careful about that. And that's a problem a lot of organizations start to run into. I noticed that a few folks on here have organizations who are paying for a version of a generative AI tool already. So you might run into the problem of we need to keep our data secure while using generative AI. And that is the value of a paid tool ultimately. Um, I'm not going to harp on this too much. It might be in or not within the budgets of different organizations, but here's some good examples. And there's way more than this. Um, so ChatGPT, besides having their free version, also has team or enterprise versions of the tool that I believe it's $25 a month or $30 a month for those different levels. 
um, per user. So it can be really expensive um, for some non for nonprofit organizations in particular. Um, Copilot, the middle one, which is offered by Microsoft, um, same thing. That's twenty dollars per user per month. Um, and Gemini by Google has their business and enterprise offerings, and same thing. Those are twenty and thirty dollars per user per month. So about three hundred sixty dollars per user per year, and that can really add up. But they definitely come with some major advantages that are worth taking advantage of. And those two advantages are one, they guarantee as part of that, that, that your data is gonna be secure. It's not gonna be leaked into the rest of a model. And so that can be really valuable, especially if you have some sensitive data. Um, but besides that, uh, I'll particularly highlight something like Copilot. If you're already using Office 365, a tool like Copilot will be able to see all of the context of your organization and tailor its results based upon what it's seeing in your organization overall. And that can be a huge boon for you and allow you to really do some more um, interesting and exciting things. Now, those are all great, but these different tools do come with some drawbacks that I think are worth thinking about. So I know a lot of you have, are using these tools on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm gonna share a quick poll with you and I'm curious about your experiences. Um, so this is an open text response. Um, you should be able to use the exact same link that you had before um, or use the QR code or the link that's um, provided on the side. So open question for you. I'm curious about some of the challenges that you've run into when using generative AI tools, um, problems that you've encountered, um, whether that's in terms of the outputs that you're getting, the inputs you're putting in, whatever it might be. Um, let's take a couple minutes and I'm curious to see some of your thoughts on that. I love seeing some folks typing. Really, thank you for that. Yep. Yep, definitely. You all are giving me exactly what I was looking for you to give me. Uh, great, great responses so far, everybody. Yeah, great, great answers. So I know folks can't see these answers. I'm just gonna start highlighting some of these things. Um, so some examples I'm seeing here are folks are calling out getting inaccurate information um, that's used to create the output in the first place. Um, there's potential issues with plagiarism or bias, for example. Um, some folks have been lucky and just haven't used it enough to actually have issues yet. Um, I'm definitely seeing the word hallucinations come up quite a few times, and we're going to talk about that in a second if you haven't quite had the chance to understand that. These are great. I'll give it another 30 seconds. Thanks for um, a whole bunch of folks have answered this. This is really, really helpful. Perfect. People are really nailing exactly some of the problems that pop up. So if you're newer to AI, or perhaps this is something that you've encountered, I think one of the biggest problems that people run into is this idea that these tools are not actually knowledge models. So in the background, when you're using ChatGPT, you're actually using a type of model called a large language model. You might see that abbreviated as LLM. And we're gonna talk a little bit more very shortly actually about how large language models actually get built and turned into something called a foundation model. So I think it's helpful to get that context. But right now, the important thing to understand is just because it can give you back language that appears human-like, that might pass the Turing test, so to speak, doesn't actually mean that it has any underlying knowledge about what's going on in the background. And this can lead to this major problem called hallucinations. And that's this idea that the output of your model is gonna create incorrect responses but the big problem is that it sounds really, really correct. And because it's like very confident in it, people trust it. Back about a year and a half ago at this point, when ChatGPT was much more brand new, this actually happened. This has a, become a somewhat famous legal case. There were a couple of lawyers who were suing an airline and, or their client was suing the airline rather. And they had to put together a legal brief and they used ChatGPT to help them out with that brief. 
And it turns out that ChatGPT, being the helpful tool that it is, gave them some legal citations um, and told them, here are like, you know, six cases that support what you're looking to do. And they went ahead and they submitted that to the court. And then it turned out the court couldn't actually find any of those citations anywhere. And it turns out that ChatGPT just completely made them up. And no one did the due diligence to actually check that information. And those lawyers ended up getting sanctioned for that. That general idea is what we call hallucination. And these are some of the best practices that you might think of. Just always remember that the chat wants to make you happy, but it's not smart. It doesn't actually know what it's talking about. It's just gonna try to please you ultimately. So it's a really, really important issue. And that's one that your organization might encounter as well. So here's the problem. We need the outputs of our generative AI tool to reference accurate, up-to-date information. So how can we do that? Some of you might have these really, really important things that you wanna make sure you get right for the community that you're serving. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip over this poll um, because I wanna make sure that we have time for all the content, but you can imagine this for yourself. So don't type it in, but just think about it. What are some scenarios in your organization where you need to be able to reference accurate information ultimately? Um, I'm guessing there's quite a few of those. Like I said, don't feel like you have to type it in. I wish we had more time for it. Just think about it for yourself. Um, I'm gonna give you a scenario though where this might be really important. So let's pretend that you're a legal aid organization. You've got a repository of case law that you want to summarize and directly reference to augment the work of your legal team. So you have a legal team who's helping uh, people in the community get access to low cost or free um, legal services. And you want to be able to help your lawyers help the community better. And you've got this special sauce of case law in the background that you want your organizations to draw from. Um, well, in that case, you'd want to be able to do something to make sure that they can actually cite those things, that the that there won't be a hallucination and your lawyers are getting accurate information to be able to help folks. We're gonna talk through a solution to this, but first I wanna step back and actually talk a little bit about how the soup is made because I think that actually helps understand how the solution itself works. Um, so first, in order to build some of these large language models, um, the way that that ends up working is if we step all the way back in time, it actually just starts with a lot of documents. Like I said, an internet scale amount of documents, every piece of text that a company like this can actually get their hands on. And what they're trying to do with that text is actually find relationships between all of the words inside of that text. So they might take the text and then break it down into its smallest component parts. Um, so for example, this is among the millions of other words that might exist they might get to, here's cat, kitten, dog, and houses. So four words to take a look at. And remember, there's millions upon millions of these. Now in practice, they actually look at much smaller portions of the words and we call those tokens. So you might see the word token pop up and those just mean a part of a word. And that's what the GPT, that's what the large language model is actually reading. Now computers, once again, can't read text. What computers read are numbers. And so what ends up happening is all of these end up being turned into numbers. So cat is actually represented by 0 0.6, 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 0 0.4, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those are vectors of numbers. If you remember back to like high school math. Now, in practice, there's actually like tens of thousands of these numbers that actually represent cat or kitten or dog, but I can't fit that on my screen. And also in practice, people don't quite know exactly what each one of those numbers represents, but they do all represent some aspect of catness or dogness or houseness or whatever it might be. So these are all made up, but each of those numbers you might think of representing like a living being or a feline, like how feline is this word? How human is the, this word? What, how gendered is it? Royalty, verb, plural, all these different things on and on and on, tens of thousands of these. And at first, you might not notice any patterns there, but there actually are. So for example, cat, kitten, and dog, you might notice have high numbers for living being, but houses has a negative number. Feline, cat, and kitten light up, but dog and houses don't. 
and houses is plural, but the other ones are singular, right? So the, there are actually these differences. You've just got to explore to find them. And it turns out if we were to graph those differences, the words end up being near each other. So cat and kitten are close by each other because they're related concepts. Dog becomes relatively near it because it's a related concept. Whereas houses is kind of further off. And obviously you can't actually graph seven dimensions, which is how many of these there are. Um, so I'm dropping it down to two dimensions to simplify things, but hopefully you get the gist. These are called embeddings. And that's how these tools actually understand the data that exists behind it. Just to give you another type of example, maybe we have man, woman, king, and queen. And in this particular case, you can see differences in gender and royalty and man to woman, king to queen, you can actually see they have a common type of relationship to each other. So in that training process, the large language model is learning those relationships between words, and that's part of how it's able to make these predictions for you ultimately. So we can actually use that to our advantage. A problem with the large language model is it only knows what it was trained on. So this new technique, so that we can get accurate information, um, and those are called foundation models. As a side note, that's what we're building our tools off of. Um, the ones you're familiar with are like GPT 3.5 and GPT 4.0. And that's what powers ChatGPT are those types of foundation models. When you use a foundation model, you give it a prompt. It goes to the foundation model and you get your output, just like we talked about earlier. Now, the way that we can step through is this idea of something called a RAG model. And that stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. If you're a person or an organization looking to make sure that your outputs of your generative AI tools have accurate information that's really, really important to you, you might be looking into RAG models. It's a terrible name. The person who actually invented them didn't know they were going to get so popular and later on has said, I wish I gave it a better name because RAG models is terrible. Um, but here's how that actually works. So like I said, normally in a model, you have a prompt or in a, in a prompting situation, you have a prompt, it goes to that foundation model we talked about, and then you get an output. Well, instead we've got to hijack that system and we need to enter in our own information for that. And that looks something like this. So in a RAG model, instead we have our prompt, but then the special sauce is this database that sits on the side over here. And that's a vector database. And so what happens in that database is we actually convert our own files. So maybe those files, thinking back to our example, are a list of all the case law that we have for our lawyers at our legal aid organization. And those get turned into those strings of numbers, those embeddings. When we then go do the prompt, first we go look inside of that vector database to find things similar there, and we annotate it, and we capture those. Now, all of that information goes to our foundation model, and our output includes that up-to-date, new, accurate information that we included. One way that our team is looking to do that at Tech Impact is we're currently building out some models focused on helping people navigate benefits cliffs. So helping people who are in the benefits system in the United States be able to more accurately understand when they might lose a benefit. And you can imagine every state has thousands, has not thousands, has tons of different rules about what that looks like. So being accurate is really important. And we're using a RAG model in order to try to help build a chatbot that will help people navigate what that looks like. So a really, really important tool overall. Now, RAG models are great, but what if you're actually working on something where the tool doesn't actually know anything about what you're talking about? The way it's trained, a generative AI model only knows what it knows at the point of training, right? And so if we're adding something into this RAG model where it already kind of knows about it, it can at least be accurate. But maybe you're doing something, you have a domain that's so specific that it's not actually even included in the model in the first place. Um, that could be a major problem that your organization actually has to deal with and try to navigate. So say different type of scenario. Let's pretend that your organization is focused on helping patients who are aging in place. Your case notes for your patients regularly include medical terminology because you're, you probably have a team of nurses or caseworkers who are going in and helping these folks in their homes, making sure that they are secure 
and able to do what they need to do to live a healthy, successful life as they're aging gracefully. Um, so let's go back to our example of man, woman, king, and queen. And imagine that there's, like I said, tens of thousands, millions of other words inside of this model. Well, here's something that the model might not include. Some medical jargon. So arteriosclerop, I can't even pronounce it because I decided to not go to med school. Arteriosclerotic dementia. That might be something that is directly impacting patients in this aging in place community. And the problem is there is no embedding. There's nothing for the model to actually go look up and try to find so that it could give you a meaningful answer about arteriosclerotic dementia. And imagine a lot of other cases for something like that as well, other medical jargon or jargon specific to your organization as well. If the model's never seen it, it can't do something with that information. You know, instead of having numbers there, it's just a big blank question mark. And it'll give you an answer because it's gonna try to please you, but it's not gonna be anything particularly useful for you. So this is where this really important solution called fine tuning comes into play. Fine tuning is this idea of let's take a foundation model and then we're gonna build on top of it. We need to build a better foundation for ourselves to be working from that's more specific to the topic that our team actually really cares about. And so the way that we do that is by more training. We go back and we add in our own set of documents, our own corpus of text that we can then use in order to go update the model and build one that actually works better for us. And so we might have new bricks in our foundation, so to speak, that are actually gonna help us do the work that we need to do in a better kind of way. Now, one caution here is that fine tuning actually can be a somewhat expensive type of operation. And I think in most cases, it's probably not something a lot of organizations here need, but if you have something that's getting more domain specific, if you, for example, are in that aging in place scenario, then this is a case where you might actually wanna be looking at fine tuning your model so that you can get some better outputs for yourself ultimately. And this will definitely take some real technical skill to do as well. Um, there are every day tools are getting better for the lay person to be able to work with it, but this is a case where you might want a machine learning or an AI engineer to be able to help guide you through this. And so you might need to augment your team or find some other way to make something like that happen. But it's a really, really, really useful technique. The other thing I wanna call out here is that there are actually repositories of fine-tuned models that other people have already built. There's a phenomenal website called Hugging Face, for example, that hosts models on it, um, open source models that you're able to utilize. They'll all have different types of licensure agreements with them. And that might be a place that you wanna check or have a team of experts go check for you so that you can see maybe we can build off of that um, and help solve our problem that way instead. Um, and here's the last example I want to give you. So, and once again, all of these can be used separately. They can build on top of each other. They're not, don't think of them as being like, we can just do fine tuning or we can just do rag. You can you do both without any doubt whatsoever. Um, and yes, uh, Kelsey, it is hugging face, not hunting space. So that would be a very fun name too. Um, so one more problem for you. Let's say that you on your team have a specialized task that you wanna use generative AI to solve repeatedly. You're doing it over and over and over again. So here's a good example of something like that. Let's pretend that your organization needs to intake new patients. When a new patient is booked and their intake survey is completed, you wanna make sure that their counselor receives a summary of their patient history, um, something easy for them to understand uh, based upon whatever that intake survey actually looked like. That's a really good case where you might actually want to string together a couple of technologies here in order to be able to, when the action happens, when the patient is booked, when their survey is completed, at that moment, we're going to go ahead and use that in order to um, make a summary of the information and then present that to our counselor. So there's a few actions being put together. So there's a great set of tools and technologies called agents and assistants that help you do that. And some of them require no code at all to use. And some, the more complicated they get, they might require more of a software engineer skill set in order to make that happen. What I'm showing you here is ChatGPT actually has a playground where you can go build your own assistants um, and do that in a no code kind of way. 
And you can give it some of those prompts and help build those tools for you. Um, similarly, if you're a Microsoft shop and already using this, Microsoft has a tool called Copilot Studio. And similarly, you're able to go build these types of tools. I believe Amazon has something exceptionally similar in their Q ecosystem. Um, lots and lots of different places have built tools like this that you're able to take advantage of. Um, in general, agents are gonna be low code or no code types of solutions. Um, and really what you're doing is you're giving it prompts or knowledge that it's gonna use in order to make these um, connections over and over again. And assistants are going to end up being more code-based. They're gonna take a little bit more time and effort to put together, but can do some more specialized types of tasks for you overall. So those are the six techniques that I wanted to spend some time talking about today for you. And so just to recap them, and like I said, all of these can be used interchangeably for sure. Um, so free tools, really great place to go ahead and get started. Something that I'd highly recommend if you're not already using them, go ahead and use them. Just play with them, figure out what it looks like. It really is almost completely no effort to just go. You don't even have to make an account in some cases. You can just get going. Um, as you start using the tools, consider prompt engineering as something to make your outputs just a little bit better. And really the key thing to remember there is the more information you give the tool, the more exacting you can be using some of those six techniques that we talked about, the better the output that you're gonna end up getting. Eventually in your organization, you might wanna be looking at paid tools that have some additional features that are gonna let you keep your data more secure um, and would probably be a better option for particularly organizations with really sensitive information overall. Those tend to cost about $20 to $30 per user per month. Um, and nonprofit licensing is kind of all over the place in those as well. At some point, you might want to end up using, you need to make sure that you have accurate, up-to-date information. And so as part of that, a really good technique is this idea of RAG models, retrieval augmented generation. Retrieve the data from a separate database, augment it to your prompt, and then generate the new output. Um, that's one of the most modern, up-to-date techniques that's relatively cost-effective and is going to make sure that you get the accurate information that you need to help the, organ the group that you're trying to help. You can fine-tune by making sure that you're solving for domain-specific knowledge, and then ultimately you could use agents and assistants to help you solve specialized tasks repeatedly. And once again, mix and match. That's not a one-size-fit-all to solve your problem. It might require like a paid tool to use an API, really advanced prompt engineering, having this set of um, a separate database of retrieval augmented generation, and then at some point fine tuning your model to really get the output that you want. They all mix and match for sure. Anyway, thank you all for spending some time with me this afternoon. Um, really, really enjoyed uh, getting to share some of these different ways you can use things. Um, if you're interested in reaching out or talking through a problem that your team is running into, where you want to be able to use generative AI a little bit more effectively or any other data type of problem, um, please feel free to reach out at ryanh at techimpact.org and really happy to take questions from folks at this point as well. I think we've got about 15 minutes or so left. Really appreciate it. That was so great, Ryan. I learned so much. Um, Jazz asks, it's a two-part question. Can you give an example on how your information can be used by free AI tools and how that will directly affect the company. The second part, will you give will you give out sensitive information to others, or will it be available for public in some way or the other? Sure. So, really, what ends up happening? Let's say that you're using ChatGPT, and I should clarify, I use ChatGPT for personal uses all the time. I think it's a really helpful tool, without any doubt whatsoever. So, ChatGPT, OpenAI, the com its parent company, um, wants to make their models consistently better. And so they actually put a note on the bottom of um, the screen that they might end up using your responses to improve their training overall. Training being the process of building a slightly better model for themselves. Um, when they do that, they're going to use all the data input that they get. And that just means that your data might end up leaking into the final model. So it's not like it's being maliciously made public. It would be really hard for someone to actually go like search for it and find it. Um, but if someone prompted exactly the right thing, you might actually end up getting um, some of those outputs put into it. 
Um, and I think you asked, it was a two part question. Could you just repeat uh, the second part for me? Yeah, I think you kind of answer it. Um, will it affect the company and will it give out, give out sensitive information to the public? Yeah, if you put sensitive information in, it may accidentally having an output including that sensitive information. Um, that's part of why at Tech Impact, for example, we have part of our AI policy is that we shouldn't be using those free tools and we should be like, we have co-pilot licenses that some folks on our team are able to take advantage of that are gonna keep our data secure. Um, so it it just depends. All of this, I'm a consultant at heart. I say it just depends more than I care to say. Um, mm -hmm. But you, know, you have to think through those things for your specific organization without a doubt. Awesome. Um, Jazz is interested in a future webinar about prompting. Yeah, I definitely would love to give it. Um, I think it can be really helpful to see just like really small tweaks um, into how you're entering a prompt can actually really get a lot more out of the tools that you're using. Um, definitely want to use tools the best way you possibly can. Awesome. And just for everybody who's asking in the um, chat about the recording, the recording will be emailed to everyone along with the slides. And if you would like the chat transcript, you have to email me directly. I'm going to put my email in the chat in just a moment. Um, someone asked, can you explain more how fine tuning works and how is it different or similar to the paid version of chat GPT? Sure. Um, so I can start with how it's uh, different from the paid version. So the paid version is going to be a really, really good, but still a general type of model that you're working from. So it for using the example I gave there about aging in place and medical terminology, now to be fair, it might know something about arthritis, I can't even say it, about the form of dementia that I mentioned there. Um, but it definitely doesn't know minutia necessarily. It, it's not going to know about specifics of your organization. It's not going to understand jargon um, that you might throw out it. And so in that particular case, um, while it's an amazing tool, it might fail to meet your needs. Um, so the way fine tuning works is you would go pick a foundation model that you want. I don't think I explained this super well. There's a lot of foundation models, um, some that you're able to use, some that you're not. I mentioned Hugging Face earlier as a resource. Um, you'll find a whole bunch of foundation models you can use there. Um, some examples of those are GPT 3.5 or GPT 4.0, um, or Llama is another really popular one that's been put out by Meta and is completely open source. That's actually probably what people use most frequently for fine tuning purposes. If I were to, that's a anecdotal number, but that is probably my best guess. And that just stands for large language model at Meta. Um, so you take that foundation model and then you take all of the, you build up a corpus of text involving the type of information that you want the model to be able to learn about and be able to give prompts more accurately about. And then from there, there's a process you go through to incorporate, without getting into like deep technical jargon, <laughs> to incorporate those things together. And now you've built a fine-tuned model that can uh, serve as what you end up prompting more consistently. So really particularly good when you've got like this domain specific kind of knowledge that you want to be able to add to. Great question. Yeah, it was. Um, um, someone asked, will TechSoup develop a relationship to reduce costs for nonprofits? Um, right now, I can't answer that. So maybe we will, maybe we won't. But that depends on um, if someone's offering that service, that product to um, TechSoup. And someone asks if you can give a recommendation for a paid tool for beginners, because they keep running into cost constraints. A paid tool for beginners because you keep running into, like meaning if you go to use you, a paid tool, it's just- Yeah, you can recommend one, like ChatGPT is like $20 a month, but is there one that you recommend to someone um, because, yeah. So in my personal life, I actually just use a free one. I haven't- found the personal need. I don't want to spend the $20 a month personally. I, I don't need it. Um, I have found that they tend to have all gravitated around that $20 a month price point. Now, another option that could exist, but you need some technical chops for it, is you could actually self-host your own version of a GPT. Um, and that comes with its own set of costs and its own technical requirements. That's a kind of skip that in the normal presentation, the self-hosted option, but that could end up working for you ultimately. Um, I don't know if I have a great recommendation that's gonna be at a lower price point. 
um, that I would feel comfortable recommending just because I personally have not tried every single one of the tools. So I, I don't think I could give you a, a perfect answer there. Okay. Question from Mildred. How is Copilot more helpful than ChatGPT for staff in office that uses Microsoft Office 365? Totally. Um, so they're definitely like slightly different tools with slightly different goals, first of all. But so our team has Copilot installed, not for every single person in the organization, but there are some licenses available. And one of the real benefits of it is it's actually kind of integrated across all of your work, right? So like once you have Copilot installed, there's now a Copilot button that activates in your Word document, a Copilot button that activates in your Teams channels, in your whatever else it might be. Just think of the whole Office 365 uh, product. And then it also has access to the documents that you've already put together. And so it can reference things in your documents. It's almost like a, I don't know the exact technology they're using there, but it's almost like a built-in RAG kind of system in some ways where it's doing that uh, referencing overall. I have found it to be an exceptionally helpful productivity tool and would highly recommend it to folks, um, at, at least for productivity types of use cases. Okay, and um, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right, but say uh, Africa, I'm gonna give you the permission to talk because you asked a question that I think um, need more explanation because you said we're managing volunteers in 12 countries. How can we onboard them all easily and send them materials in real time? I'm not sure if you're talking about onboarding them the tech soup or what. So you can unmute yourself and, and ask this question because I'm not sure if I uh, understand that. And then while you, we're waiting for you to unmute, go ahead. I see you unmuted. Go ahead. Thank you so very much. I am the CEO of Sayap Africa based in California. And uh, we have 12 chapters in uh, 12 African countries. Volunteers from the US, uh, Ivy League schools to Paris, to Africa. So our issue is how can we onboard them? How can we make sure that um, they, we because we repeat the same thing over and over again when we have new volunteers. And it is so hard for us to really retrieve the documents, send them again. Is there any way we can automate the document and using AI to be able to onboard all these volunteers? And also the timesheet, how can we make sure that the timesheet uh, is sent to us in real time from Africa to Boston to everywhere um, uh, our volunteers are? <laughs> I don't question. know if you got it. No, I, I think you're basically like, if I were to super boil it down, is that you have these repeatable processes that you're doing, like yes. volunteers or making sure time sheets are collected. And it takes a lot of work for your team to be able to do that. And so I, I think what I'm unsure of is whether or not that's a generative AI type of problem or if it's an automation type of problem. And to be fair, those could actually intersect with each other. So the short answer to your question is yes, what you're describing is absolutely possible to be able to automate those things and take a load off of your team's back, so to speak, and make that more consistent and repeatable and a better process. And what I'd have to learn more about is whether or not there is a generative AI, AI opportunity there, or if it's more of a just like process automation type of question. Both really, really important, but yes, you can you can absolutely do those things. Does that answer your question? I mean, with what chat GPT, because um, we are using the free chat GPT is helping a lot really to respond to all the requests. I, lo I love it. I love it so much in French and in English. I can use it easily. But the, the thing is, yes, you answer for the automation, but for the AI, um, is there any way to to like put the timesheet in the AI so that it generate not only to automation, but also to say, respond to questions and to um, send the information easily? Or maybe I don't know how to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so, know what I need. I don't know how to ask it in technical. <laughs> no, no, no. You're doing just, just fine. Completely fine. So I think if if the question I'm hearing is, can we make it so that it's you can answer questions about the timesheets that people have submitted? Is that like a, a decent summary of like very high level summary? Yeah, of yes, yes. And the onboarding material easily to rather, yeah, just to 
Yeah, send so, them with the name of whoever is the new volunteers without me having to type everything again. Yeah, I, actually, the comment that someone, uh, Joyce, just put in the chat, I think answers it pretty well. So I think there's a combination of like a bot or an agent that could help solve uh, some of those questions and potentially utilizing like a RAG type of system might make sense where the information that you're putting inside of the RAG is actually going to be some of that timesheet information. Um, but, you know, I'd definitely be happy to chat with you a little bit more about it and get some of like more clear detail than I think we're going to be able to get just in, in this. So if you want to shoot me an email, I'm like really happy to spend 30 minutes just chatting about it for sure. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so Saraj, can the automation function do full workflow, which would incorporate criteria logic? I think you may have probably answered some of that. Yeah, I think that's probably a, a similar answer to what it, we just ended up talking about with PSYOP. Awesome, awesome. Well, this was so good. It's like one of the best uh, webinars I've seen on AI. Like you started out basic and even the basic, I was like, oh my God, I didn't know that. Then you went really technical. That was so good. So thank you, Ryan. You got lots of thank yous in the chat. Um, you guys see Ryan's information in the on the screen. Um, feel free to reach out to him. And would like the chat transcript, just send me an email and we'll get those over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Aretha. Thanks for the to the tech soup team for having us. And thanks for all the questions, everybody. Yeah, thanks. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye, all.